Hello, this is Jackie Moore, and I'm excited to be teaching marketing of high technology products and innovations to you this semester. One of the most important questions that people ask is, why do we need to have a separate marketing course for technology products? And it's a very interesting question. Think about most high-tech companies. The fact is, many of them don't believe that marketing is necessary. And in fact, they frequently say our product is so good it will sell itself. In addition, in many high-tech companies, the people who do marketing are often engineers or product designers who haven't been trained in marketing. And the fact is, in high-tech industries, marketing is more important than ever because it's hard for customers to understand how to buy and use the product. As you also see on the next slide, it's a fallacy to believe that technological superiority will lead to success in high-tech industries. And in fact, many studies show that the road to success for technology products is a combination of great technology and great marketing. And for this to happen, it requires that there be trained marketing personnel who are treated as peers with product developers and engineers to bring knowledge of customers, markets, and applications to the company's decision making even during the product development process. Oftentimes when I teach this course to engineers, when I say the word marketing, it means different things to different people. And so one of the first things we have to be clear on is when we use the word marketing, what does it even mean? The first bullet on this slide essentially is a definition that is given by the American Marketing Association. And what this def definition shows is that marketing is designed to create, communicate, and deliver products to customers, which obviously is a very broad mandate. The creation of, com of products includes R&D and product design. Communication includes advertising, branding, trade shows, and delivery includes partners, distribution channels, and sales. At its heart, however, marketing is more than just these functional activities. In high-tech organizations, marketing is actually a philosophy of doing business, which means it's part of the organizational culture. And it's values as a company that stresses customer knowledge and customer needs as the basis for decision making in the company. We're definitely going to be coming back to this as a critical aspect of high-tech marketing as we go through the course. Now if we review what you know about marketing already, essentially marketing can occur at three different levels. The first level is the strategic level. And the strategic level will be covered in Chapter 2 when we get to that section. Strategic marketing decisions are focused on which customers a company chooses to serve. And this is a more complicated question than might appear at first blush. It goes through the segmentation, targeting, and positioning process, which we will cover in Chapter 7. And the strategic level, essentially by answering what customers should we serve, the flip side of that question is which customers or markets do we choose not to serve? And so this is a focus question for the organization. It's definitely related to the competitive market space, how do we understand competition, and it's also related to the company's value proposition. This is the most important aspect of marketing, and if these decisions about which customers and which value are not answered carefully, really the other aspects of marketing are likely to be misguided and even wasted expenditures. At the second level of marketing, we have the functional level, 
and for those of you who have been classically trained in marketing, you might know these functions as the four P's. Product management, price management, promotion management, and place or distribution strategies. What's important in the high-tech marketing space is that the functional area of marketing also includes the marketing department as a functional area and how marketing personnel in the organization interact with the research and development personnel. R&D people, depending on the company, are sometimes called engineers, scientists, product developers, and as we'll see, that interface between marketing and R&D is often filled with conflict. And in order to be successful in the high-tech marketing space, that conflict must be identified and productively resolved. At its heart, marketing is about every interaction that a customer has with the company, its products, and its employees. And if we look at the functional area of marketing in terms of the customer's perspective, we see this phrase, moments of truth used. So think about when a customer has a technical support question, and they maybe call an 800 number or go to a website to a fax frequently asked questions page. This is called a moment of truth because every interaction with the customer can either cement the customer's loyalty and relationship, or it can alienate or dissatisfy the customer. And the fact is, in most high-tech company, companies, it's not only marketing people who have these critical moments of truth with customers. It's technical support, it's billing, it's salespeople. And if all of those people aren't aligned around the customer value, again, those efforts can be wasted. The tactical level of marketing includes essentially the implementation of what many high-tech companies think is marketing. Who's going to build the website? Who's going to attend the trade show? Who's going to write the marketing brochure? And the fact is, all these decisions about marketing tactics are important, but marketing is much more than that. And again, if we don't have the right value proposition crafted, these tactical efforts are likely to fail. How does high-tech marketing differ from traditional marketing? In order to answer this question, we first must understand how does the high-tech environment differ from more traditional marketing contexts. In the book, we go through various definitions of high technology, and the approach we like to use in the book is based on this approach of examining common characteristics that all high tech environments share. And one of the benefits of using this approach to characterize high tech environments is that it provides immediately actionable marketing strategies that are derived from these characteristics. As you'll see in this Venn diagram, it's not each dimension alone that characterizes the high-tech environment. It is the intersection of all three dimensions. Let's start with market uncertainty. Market uncertainty is defined as ambiguity that customers face about how their needs will be satisfied by a new technology. So essentially, market uncertainty captures this idea of customer ambiguity. And the first sub-dimension of this characteristic is what is called the FUD factor. FUD stands for fear, uncertainty, and doubt which essentially means customers really are not sure if they're going to be able to use the product appropriately, how complex it might be, whether it has compatibility with other components they may have already in their house or in their business. And this first dimension is described very clearly 
in Jeffrey Moore's book, Crossing the Chasm. That's Jeffrey, G-E-O-F-F-R-E-Y, and Moore is M-O-O-R-E. Jeffrey Moore is considered to be the guru of high-tech marketing in Silicon Valley, and we'll be covering his book, Crossing the Chasm, extensively in Chapter 7. Another sub-dimension of market uncertainty is the fact that customer needs change rapidly and often in unpredictable ways. And this rapidity of change is very difficult to forecast and customers themselves may not be able to articulate how their needs will change simply because they don't know what technologies may be coming online. If we look at the electric vehicle market in the year 2013, customers oftentimes say that they need access to charging infrastructure, which is a function of the type of plug that they have on their car. There's level 1 charging, level 2 charging, level 3 charging, and the fact is, it could be that with the advent of wireless charging, they may no longer need level 2 compatible plug charging because we're going to go to wireless. That would be an example of this second dimension. Customers also often face uncertainty because they don't understand standards in the marketplace. Let's say that a customer does want level 3 charging. There are two plug types for level 3 charging. There's the SAE1772 plug type and there is the Chatamo type. Chatamo is used in the Nissan LEAF. It's deployed widely in Japan, but in the United States we have a different plug. So this concern can prevent customers from even buying the high-tech product, the electrical vehicle, in the first place. Uncertainty over the pace of adoption means that because of these first three factors, companies don't really understand how quickly they may, may need to ramp up the manufacturing of the product or the scaling of their technology infrastructure. And the fact is, overcapacity can be as critically uh, harmful as can be undercapacity, in which case a company really misses its opportunity. And certainly that's related to the inability to forecast market size in these markets. We'll cover a section on high-tech forecasting in our section on market research. The second dimension of high technology environments is technology uncertainty. This focuses more on the technology itself rather than the customer anxiety. With respect to technology itself, when new high-tech products come online, technology uncertainty is really this uncertainty of knowing whether the technology can even deliver on its promise. So for example, if we're going to uh, take Elon Musk's new invention called the Hyperloop, which is a way of using vacuum tubes for fast transportation. His vision is to get from San Francisco to LA in 15 minutes. How do we even know whether that new innovation is going to function as promised? The fact is he's also in charge of space transportation with his SpaceX initiative. Who wants to be the first person to ride that a spaceship that's going to be brand new given technology uncertainty. From a developer's perspective, there's also quite a bit of uncertainty over the timetable for product development, and most technologies take quite a bit longer to actually come to the market than is forecast by the developers at the outset. In addition, once the technology is bought by a customer, how do we even know if the supplier will be able to fix any problems that the technology may experience? One of my favorite subdimensions of technology uncertainty are unanticipated or unintended consequences. For example, one of the unintended consequences of level one charging for electric vehicles has been what the government euphemistically calls thermal events, which essentially means they catch fire. 
Concerns over obsolescence, this is faced both by customers and companies, but the fact is we know that the ongoing pace of technology evolution means that eventually one technology will be superseded or made obsolete by another, and these concerns sometimes cause uh, quite a few headaches both for developers and customers. Competitive volatility is the third dimension of high-tech environments. And compared to competitive intelligence in traditional industries, in which we oftentimes know who the competitors of soda or beer or shoes might be, in the high-tech environment, we oftentimes don't even know who our competitors are. And this essentially arises both because new startups are coming into the game. How many of you realized that there might be a new competitor called Better Place making electric vehicles? And rather than selling cars, they were selling minutes of electric miles traveled, very much like you buy a telecommunications or cell phone plan. And so that captures this idea of uncertainty, who future competitors are and the rules of the game. How do they make money? In fact, one of the biggest changes in the rules of the game is that things are given away free today by many high-tech companies. You don't pay for Facebook. And then their business model is based on something else entirely. In this case, it's based on selling your eyeballs to advertisers. Product form competition essentially means that two completely different products solve the same need for customers. Um, one uh, example that's really clear is the fact that many of us don't wear watches anymore or carry cameras because all those functions are built into our cell phones. So that would be an example of what's known as convergence. One technology now provides all those functions in one form factor. When we talk about competitive volatility specifically, there are two terms I'd like you to know. One is myopia, which is being narrow-sighted when it comes to defining who my competitors are. And the other is creative destruction, which means a company's willingness to make investments in future technologies even at the expense that those new technologies will make obsolete their current product offerings. Let's give an example of a company who did not engage in creative destruction. Kodak, as a camera and film company, was very slow to jump on the digital bandwagon. They did not engage in creative destruction, and as a result, They've had to lay off tens of thousands of workers, and in the process, they have been destroyed by consumer electronics companies and other camera companies who are able to move into the digital environment more readily. There's a layperson's term for creative destruction, and it's called, you've been Amazoned. And essentially what this means is, you have been destroyed or outcompeted by a forward-looking company who was willing to invest in new technologies while, for example, Barnes & Noble was not willing to go online because they didn't want to cannibalize sales from their brick-and-mortar stores. So the lesson here is you either want to engage in creative destruction as a company or you will be Amazoned. I'd like you to go ahead and cover the table in the book that identifies three sources of marketing myopia and think about how they apply to companies that you know. Technology life cycles are very much related to competitive volatility. So I'm going to look at the picture of technology life cycles first and then I'll come back to this slide. Technology life cycles are S-shaped curves, and for every graph we cover in this class, I would like you to articulate the two dimensions of those graphs. The first dimension here is time on the horizontal dimension, 
and time is correlated with R&D investments in that technology platform. The performance dimension oftentimes is captured by performance that is unique to that product category. For example, if we're talking about chips, it may be the speed of the processing in megahertz relative to the heat output. If we're talking about cars, it could be miles per gallon traveled or the cost of traveling. And if we stick with our car example, the current S-shaped curve would be internal combustion engines. And what you'll see with the S-shape, essentially the curves start out relatively flat, where with R&D dollars expended, we don't see huge improvements in the performance. And then we hit the first inflection point where we see rapid improvements in that technology's performance relative to R&D. Scientists understand the internal combustion engine and how to essentially squeeze more efficiency out of the technology. But at some point, the technology platform itself is going to hit an upper limit, where even with additional R&D invested, we're not going to see improvements in the performance of that technology as a platform. In which case, oftentimes new technologies are being introduced, typically by outside industry startups who have a new way of looking at the problem and they invent a new technology platform to solve the problem. So for example, what we're going to see is that internal combustion engines are going to hit an upper platform on efficiency. The new technology so far has been hybrid engines, a combination of battery and internal combustion. The newest technology is going to be all EV or pure electric vehicles. And the fact is, right now customers are paying a premium to drive those vehicles. What you see on these S-shaped curves going over to the left-hand dimension is that when the new technology comes online, its performance typically is beneath that of the incumbent technology. And because of that, the incumbent technology providers frequently um, dismiss or denigrate the new technology saying, oh, it will never amount to anything. But technology life cycles do progress, and this S-shaped curve eventually means that new technology is going to ramp up to a particular point and supersede and overtake the prior generation of technology. And these technology life cycles mean that if an existing company, let's switch back to Kodak, isn't simultaneously experimenting with digital technology, even while it's optimizing its revenue from the prior technology platform, it may end up being Amazoned or outcompeted. So let's go back one slide. This idea of evolution in generations of technology is formalized in Moore's Law. This Moore is Gordon Moore, who was one of the pioneers in the semiconductor industry. And his law formally stated with respect to semiconductors or the chips in your electronic devices states, performance of an existing technology doubles every 18 months with no increase in price. And that's what you see with these S-shaped curves. Another way to say this is at a given price point, performance of the new technology will double every 18 months. So from a customer's perspective, why don't you just go ahead and wait? And in some length of time, the length of time is unique to each technology, you'll be able to buy more bang for your buck. And what you see is Moore's Law can also predict these upper limits of a particular generation of technology. I encourage you to Google Moore's Law. It's a really important foundation of technology markets. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to the implications of TLC, technology life cycles. As I've said, these new technologies often come from new companies outside the industry. Think Tesla, not a car company uh, that existed prior to electric vehicles. At its initial introduction, it often underperforms the legacy technology. 
These cars were hugely expensive because of the battery technology. Incumbent, incumbents therefore underestimate the viability. And then ultimately when these new technologies do succeed, they catch these established firms by surprise and they are often Amazoned. Okay, this concludes the first podcast for Chapter 1. The second podcast will pick up with these other characteristics of high-tech industries. We've completed the three common characteristics of high-tech environments.